Welcome back to this series on archival data research, where I show you how to do archival data research in MATLAB. And we have been working on replicating the famous Ball Brown 1968 paper. Um, in the last video, we ended up getting through replicating figure one, which is the famous figure from the paper right here on page 169. So we had gotten through that, um, and we had replicated and generated this figure here. Now we're using a different sample time period than they were using. Um, as we've said before, they used 1946 through 1966, and we're using a 1970 through 1990 sample time period. And we get a similar sort of picture that they got, but it does differ. Um, at least over our sample time period, we're not replicating PEED, post earnings announcement drift. Earnings are announced at time zero. We do get that when the announcement is positive, when it's a positive announcement, positive earnings surprise, whether you measure earnings as net income, the solid line, or whether you measure it as um, earnings per share, the, the dashed line here. If it's a positive earnings surprise that's announced, if the earnings that are announced are positive or a positive surprise to the market, then prices for those companies were already starting to drift upward over the prior 12 months. And if earnings announced are a negative surprise, prices were already starting to drift downward. So we get that part of the graph. We get this part like they get. It's just after earnings are announced, they find that prices in the positive surprise region continue to drift upward for a time for another three months before they level off and then start to go back down and same thing in the negative earnings surprise uh, part of the graph. Prices continue to drift downward. We did not find that result. After the surprise, prices stagnate. In fact, they start to go up again over here. And then in the, in the negative earnings surprise part of it, we um, prices stagnate. They don't continue to go down. So, of course, we're using a different sample time period. Um, one thing I did go back and do in the code is in computing the abnormal performance index for month M, which was the equation on, pa in page, on pa page 168 in the paper right here. Um, in the video I did last time, I didn't actually put this into the code. I just, I programmed it down here. We did this code down here. We did all of this, but I didn't put it in the equation in the, um, in the actual code. So I went back and did that. I went put that back in the code. And so if you want to put that in your version of the code, if you're following along, I guess I can open this up here and copy this like I've done in previous videos, put it in a Word document. Then you can pause the video and type exactly what you see. So again, to get a, an equation in your code, all you have to do is you know, come down here underneath uh, control shift L or insert equation, LaTeX equation, control shift L. You do this and then you can copy and paste what you see here on the screen. Well, you won't be able to copy it and paste, but you can pause the video and type that, make it bigger for you. Type that in this um, box here. And a preview of what you're typing should show up as you're typing it down here, and then you can hit OK, and then that would get put in your code. So that's how you get the equation in there again. All right, so I'm going to close this. So I went and put that back in. And then we left off, you know, right here with making the plot, um, and that produced this plot right here. All right. So in this um, video, I want to finish up. I want to go and there's a couple things more I'm going to replicate from their paper. And we're going to go here to, oh, I guess before we, one more thing before we continue and finish up. We're going to finish, by the way, the replication of the Ball Brown paper in this video. Notice right here, and I showed this to you in the last video, their final sample, because of all their constraints, their final sample only has 261 firms. So their plot is based on 261 firms worth of data. 
And our plot is based on, so if you recall up here, this portion of the code, we created this firm underscore API overall. And that for each firm, for each firm and each earnings announcement month, for each earnings announcement uh, for firms that we had where their earnings announcement was made um, month zero, that's month zero in the plot, which is column 15 of this. And these are all the firms that had at least 18 um, months of return data available surrounding their earnings announcement. So we got the 12 months prior, or we got the 11 months prior, plus this is the 12 months. 12th month and then we got the uh, six months after so it's 18 months and so because of the constraint having to have 18 uninterrupted you know consecutive months of observations surrounding their earnings announcement month for each firm we were only left with 1703 firm month announcements and how many unique firms does that represent in the ball brown paper it was 261 in our paper if we just quickly type unique firm underscore API overall, all rows column one, and we get the unique GV keys. But then that'll just give us the list of the unique GV keys. But if we get the size of that in the rows direction, that'll tell us how big that is. We only have 215 firms in our sample, and they had 261. Even though we're using a later sample time period from 1970 to 1990, and there should be more, more data, but this is is what we have all right I wanted to mention that so if we go here to I want to replicate this next the value of the annual net income relative to other sources of information so down here we have so it says if the difference between the realized and the expected return, in other words, the unexpected return that we've computed, the abnormal return, if we accept that as also indicating the value of new information, so that's a big assumption. And I've actually have my, some of my own research I've done which shows that I don't believe that that's a good assumption that the unexpected return is the value of new information to the market. But if we accept that as the value of new information, then it is clear that the value of new monthly information, good or bad, about an individual stock is given by that particular stock's um, absolute value, is given by the absolute value of that particular stock's return residual. In other words, the absolute value of that particular stock's abnormal return. V sub JM is the abnormal return for stock J in month M. So we take the absolute value, um, then that is the value of new information good or bad, just take the absolute value, whether it's a negative number or a positive number, the absolute value is the magnitude of the value of new information. So then it, they say it follows that the value of all monthly information concerning the average firm received in the 12 months preceding the report in our sample is given by this equation here. So we're going to actually uh, compute this equation So what I'm going to do next in our code is compute value of all monthly information concerning the average firm So the, compute the value of all monthly information concerning the average firm received in the 12 months preceding and including the, I should say, the 12 months up through the report date per the paper and see uh, C equation on page 174 because that's the page that this equation is on if we go up here 174 and that equation I'm just gonna copy and paste it 
So I want to control shift L. I'm going to put a LaTeX equation in our. I'm just going to copy and paste it from the answer key here. Oh, whoops. That wasn't right. There we go. And as I always do, I like to put a, a space between it. And when we start typing our code next. So So what we're actually going to do here is I have to code this. I have to code what's inside the brackets first for each firm. And then I can compute the whole thing as just the mean. You can see when every time you have, um, when we're summing over all the firms and then we're dividing by the number of firms, that's the mean, right? So we need to compute what's in the brackets for each firm for each as of each as of the end of each month leading up to the month zero here as you can see month zero is in the top of the product and then we'll take the mean in the next step so for i equals one to increment by one all the way up to the size of uh, firm api overall we can do it that way in the rows direction so we're going to go row by row through firm api overall and we're going to compute the mean, you know, of, I'm not the mean, but the, um, we're going to compute the, what's inside the, the brackets here, the product of one plus the absolute value. These are the, let me think here, is this correct? So these numbers are, are already the API, which is one plus the unexpected return. Where are unexpected returns? Those are over here. Yeah. Here are un actual unexpected returns down here. 12 months prior for this particular firm, 11 months prior, 10 months prior. And the firm API overall has the um, one plus those numbers. And then we have taking the product to get to the API overall, yeah. We're taking the product, like like this number right here, firm API overall for this 1045 is from the last video that would be one plus this number times one plus this number time times one plus this number times one plus this number would give us are we in the fourth yeah we give us the 1.1028 so um so we're not doing anything with the api here what we are doing though is in each individual firm's cell array here are the 18 unexpected returns surrounding this firm's earnings announcement they announced earnings um, for 19 for fiscal year 1982. They announced it as you saw you saw in the last video in 1983 on in March, and so here are the 18 months of unexpected returns surrounding that firm's earnings announcement. We computed all that in the last video. So to compute this equation right here, we need to figure out the product of one plus each. You know, one plus this, one plus the absolute value of this, sorry, one plus the absolute, one plus the absolute value of this, t and then times one plus the absolute value of this, times one plus, and so forth. So that's what we need to do. So we know that there, there are um, 1,703 uh, different firm month observations, firm different firm earnings announcement month observations that we have. 
So the size of this uh, cell in the columns direction is also 1703. So we can we can either do this way. This this right here is 1703 basically, right? So for each one of these, or if we want to be really specific, we can say underscore month underscore what is this called again? And cell in the columns direction. So firm, we're going to call it firm TI overall, row I, columns one through three, will just be the same thing as firm underscore month underscore and cell one I, um, row one, columns one through three. Oh, I need to. I'm not I'm not typing lines of code right now. What am I Let me cut this. I need to put that uh put this stuff down. Whoops. Uh, what am I doing here? Go ahead and copy what I have here. Put that there. But then in here I gotta have put a space there, space there. All right. All right. So I'm gonna call it firm TI overall. And we're going to be measuring what's inside the brackets for each firm. And then to get the TI zero, the total information, the total income, what is it called? The value of all monthly information concerning the average firm. Then we will, um, the total information in income in the earnings announcement will be um, the average of each of these things we're about to calculate. So. Let J go from four, increment by one, but only go up to 15 because it's in month, it's right here. This is month zero. Column 15 is month zero. And we're only going in our formula here up to month zero, the earnings announcement month. So firm underscore TI overall, row I, whoops, row I column J will equal the product of the absolute value and all we're doing is this right in here the product of the absolute value of one plus oh wait the product of one plus the I'm gonna put spaces in here so it's easier to see plus the absolute value of that unexpected return which is in firm month and sell row uh j hmm, let me think row two right because it's always on row two column j starting in column where j equals four so column j so this right here for a given J, and with M equal to negative 11, is what's inside the brackets here. End, end. So firm underscore TI overall looks like this. And now to get the total value, to get one number, the value of new information, the value of all monthly information in our sample, we need to take the mean of all of these numbers here and then subtract one from that mean. In other words, we need to find the mean of each of these columns. And there are 12, 12 columns here. And once we have the mean of all, in other words, we need the mean of all of these numbers, 
all of these numbers. But the mean of, we'll get the mean of each column, and then we'll take the mean of those means. That'll get one number. Then we'll subtract one from that. That'll be our TI zero. But we're going to do that next. We're not going to do it right now. We're going to do that. Just keep in mind we're going to do that. Now we're going to compute the value of net information concerning the average firm. received in the 12 months through, what, how did I phrase that? Up through, up through the report, the um, announcement, earnings announcement date. That's what I should say right here. up through the earnings announcement date per the paper. See the equation at the top of page 175. So now we're going to compute, now we're going to, so for their sample the total information was 0 0.731 and we're going to see what it is for our sample. For any one particular stock some of the information between months will be offsetting the value of net information received in the 12 months preceding the report about the average stock is given by this formula, where NI in denotes the net information. We have to compute everything inside the absolute value symbol, including the absolute value first, and then we can take the mean of that. So, and keep in mind, uh, this right here, you take the product, order of operations, you take the product, you take this product first, and then from that, once you have that product, then you subtract one. That's why they have the parentheses around this. It's not one minus one, and it's just the product of VJM. You do this first. There should be a, a big parentheses really around this, a left parentheses here and a right parentheses here. You do that first, then you subtract one. They don't technically have to have that because this is order of operations. You should understand that that's what's going on by having these two parentheses here. But All right. So I'll just copy and paste the, um, I'll copy and paste, so let's insert a LaTeX equation, and I'll copy and paste that there and there. Oh, wait, let me undo that before I make a mistake. We'll put some code down here, and then we'll copy and paste it right here. Um, now let me go back. So for those of you who are trying to follow along with the video, let me go back and copy and paste these things into Microsoft Word so that you can pause the video and type what you see. So there's the total information. If you want to get the total information equation into the into uh, MATLAB using LaTeX. That's that, and here's the net information equation. So you can pause the video right, right there. This is the first equation, and this is the second equation. You can pause the video and type those things. All right, I'm gonna close this. Close this. All right, so now we're trying to do uh, this equation, which is the same thing as is this right I've just put it in the in the MATLAB into MATLAB so you we don't have to keep going back and forth with the paper so for it's for it's just the same thing it's gonna be like very similar to this so I'm gonna copy and paste this changes to uh, NI instead of TI for total information NI for net information Um, I 
Yeah, that's fine. All right. So, except now we have to change the equation because now we have the absolute value of the product of firm underscore and firm underscore month underscore and cell one I row two columns four through J. Now we have columns four through J. Up here, oh, this should have been four through J as well, sorry. Four through J. Yeah, that's why we have that product. So we're we're going in here for total information. We're computing the absolute value of this thing plus one, and then taking the product of that. So for for this for month negative twelve, it's just that number, the absolute value of this plus one. For month negative 11, it's the absolute value of this plus 1 times the absolute value of this plus 1, right? For this, it's the absolute value of this plus 1 times the absolute value of this plus 1 times the absolute value of this plus 1. So, so it's column, it's row 2, uh, column 4 through J, where J ranges from 4 to 15, right? That's what we have up here. So we're going to have to rerun this to get the right. And then this also is, so, th and do we do the equation correctly? We have the one, we have the one plus this in here. We're, again, right here, we're just doing what's inside the brackets. And right here, we're just doing what's inside the absolute value sign, including the absolute value sign. So I haven't subtracted the one yet from the product. So after we get outside the product, then subtract one. All right, I think that's right. Oh, no, there's a one plus this in here. Like that. There we go. All right. So we'll we'll go ahead and run this now. And then then um, ti underscore zero is just so if we could look at firm month ti overall. We want to find the mean of all of these numbers for ti underscore zero. And for ni underscore zero, we want to find the mean of all of these numbers. And so for ti underscore zero, right? That's what we want to do here. For ti underscore zero, we want to find the mean of all those numbers and then subtract one from that mean. And for ni underscore zero, we just want to find the mean of all those numbers. So for ti underscore zero, we're going to find take the mean of firm underscore ti overall all rows columns four to end but this will just give the mean of each of the columns that'll give the mean of each of the columns so this will give 12 numbers it'll be a 1 by 12 row vector where in column one of the row vector, that's the mean of this column, and column two of the of that one by twelve row vector will be the mean of this column, and so forth. And then we want the mean of those means. So this is just one number, and then from that one number, we want to subtract one according to according to this order of operations here. And then we want to compare this. Um, to the paper's value of 0 0.731. 
See, they average over all firms in years, so that's why we're taking the mean of all these numbers. And then ni underscore zero equals the mean of the mean of firm, whoops, the mean of the mean of firm underscore ni overall all rows, columns four through end. But that's it then. No, don't subtract a one because we're just taking the mean of all these numbers. And we want to compare this number, whatever we get for this number, to the value of 0 0.165. And this is on page 175. And the other thing, and the point 0.165 is right here. It's also on page 175. All right, so let's go ahead and do that now. So our TI0 is 0.5592 and our NI0 is 0 0.1505 as compared to their 0 0.731 and 0 0.165. Of course, we have a different sample. And then what we want to do is we want to compute the offsetting information and persistent information per the paper. And we want to compare what we get to number one in the middle of page 175. In other words, we're trying to do, we're not going to do this down here, income information. But we're just trying to compare what we get. So from the above numbers, we conclude about 75% of the value of all information appears to be offsetting, which in turn implies that about 25% persists. So we can do this calculation with our numbers and then one minus that calculation will be one minus the 0.75 will be the 0.25. And so uh, in the paper, the value of offsetting information or the um, percentage of offsetting information is given by the uh, TI0 minus NI0 divided by TI0. And then the... the the percentage of persistent information is times 100%, I guess. And the percentage of persistent information is just 100 or is just um, 1 minus the offsetting information. So let me just copy and paste. I had it wrong over here in my answer key, but now I have it right. All right. Let's insert those equations in here. And then we can go ahead and compute um, offset. Offset underscore percent. Can I, I? You can't put percentage in a variable's name. I'll just say offset equals um, uh, ti underscore zero minus ni underscore zero divided by ti underscore zero. All of that times a hundred. And then persistent equals um, 100 minus offset. Um,
let's go ahead and put the equation in the paper here or in our code we have that and then of course so you can put it in your code I'll open a word document like I've been doing copy and paste it you can pause the video there and type that to get your MATLAB script to look exactly like my MATLAB script um, why is this not allowing so we can go ahead and compute offset and we get 73.0871 percent and they got 75 percent so we're, we're getting pretty close in our replication to those numbers and then why is persist why can't I set it equal to 100 minus offset It just says invalid MATLAB syntax. There's nothing invalid. I'm setting the variable persistent equal to, or persist equal to, oh, persistent. Why was I wasn't allowed to name a variable persistent. I don't know exactly why. Maybe that name is specially reserved for a function or something. I'm not sure, but anyway. And then persist, then it's just 100 minus the 73. Uh, 0.0871 percent so persist is 26.91 percent whoops whoops what did I do whoops persist equals 100 minus offset there we go and I'm going to save save what we have thus far so um, we're able to replicate that part and get pretty close to theirs um, Let's try to talk about the, what does it mean for the, what is this talking about? The value of all information appears to be offsetting. So we have total information given by this equation in our sample. We go and compute for each, from TI overall, we compute for each firm month announcement. The, we plot, basically we compute the API, we track the API over time all the way up all the way up until we get to the um, that particular firm's uh, the month they announced earnings we plot the it's not quite the API it's not one plus the unexpected return the product of those numbers it's the product of one plus the absolute value of the unexpected returns right right here and that's where the absolute value denotes just the value of the new information whether good or bad as you can see here so the TI sub zero, the 0.7, what did we get? 0.73, or no, we got 0.5592, and they got 0.731, but the 0.5592 appears to be the, the value of all monthly information concerning the average firm received in the 12 months preceding the report. So the average firm, the value of all the monthly information in those 12 months leading up to their month announcement date, their earnings announcement date is 0.5592. And it says here for any one particular stock, some of the information between months will be offsetting. Some of the information between months will be offset. Oh, okay. So you have information in month minus 12 you get information in month minus 11 that in other words if the unexpected return in month minus 12 is negative then but then it's positive in month minus 11 then they're saying that that's offsetting what was already the information that was in that previous number so the net information you don't consider the absolute value and the total information you use the absolute value that's the idea so the net information on average for a given stock of the 12 months leading up to the stock's monthly earnings announcement date or the fourth quarter earnings announcement date is um, on average across all firms and years in the sample is the point uh, five one five oh five.
Net, net information is 0 0.1505 for the average firm. Total information is 0 0.5592. And so, yeah, then, then it makes sense. Given that, it does make sense that we can figure out how much what value? What's what? What? Uh, what percentage of the value of all the information appears to be offsetting? Right, right. So we got all the information 0.5592 on average for a given firm. Of that 0.1505 is what's offsetting, and so what percentage of this is is um offsetting? You know, you just do this minus this divided by this, and you get about 73% of this information is offsetting for the average firm, and the other 26.9% per is persists as actual information that wasn't offset in the previous month. We're learning new something new that we didn't already know basically. So yeah, that's the um that's all we're going to replicate in this paper. We're not going to replicate this. Um, I've done enough. You can go ahead and try on your own to replicate the other parts of the paper. Like I talked about in the, at the end of the last video, I mean we could have replicated table 6 which is just a contingency table of the signs of the income forecast errors by variable. We only had two variables in our paper. In our paper, we only used net income for variable one and earnings per share for variable two. They also use a third variable. So you couldn't replicate that part from what we've done this far, but you should be able to replicate the first, you know, this, this much of table six, you should be able to replicate uh, right here this much. Um, you can figure out for variable one, how many of the earnings uh, announced unexpected earnings were positive versus how many were negative for variable one? Same thing for variable two, how many were positive and how many were negative? And then I guess uh, what's on the off diagonal here is I'm not sure what's on the off diagonal. Oh, okay, I see. So when variable one was positive, how often was variable two positive? When variable one was negative, how often was variable two positive? Yeah, that's the contingency table. So you could, you could go and replicate that really easily by coming back in here and going to our firm API overall or we could go to other the information to replicate table six is in other places in our code but right here it's just column two and column three this is call this is variable one one and this is variable two so first get how many positives unexpected earnings were there how many positive unexpected earnings were there remember it's a one if it's positive and a negative one if it's negative the actual unexpected earnings are right here. These are the actual unexpected earnings. We use net income here and we use EPS here. So how many of these numbers are positive and how many of these numbers are negative? But that was we already put that over here. We put a a negative one if the number Oh, and you can't go back to unexpected earnings because this has all of the original data, 2934, but then we removed a lot of those. We got down to 1703, so you, you have to use this one. You can't use this one because we removed a lot of these that we had their unexpected earnings, but we didn't have returns surrounding the 18-month time period in the month that they announced, so we had to delete a lot. So, yeah, from, from, from this double array here, you can – how many in column two, how many, how many ones do you see and how many negative ones do you see? If you see a one, it means that unexpected net income was positive. If you see a negative one, it means unexpected net income was positive negative and then here is related this is re referring to the eps variable if you see a positive one it's ep unexpected eps was negative was positive and if you see a negative one unexpected eps was negative and you could do this contingency table based on those two variables one and two you can complete i guess this part of it right here just what am i doing just this part of it you can complete so yeah I hope you all have enjoyed this replication of Ball Brown. Uh, I guess there's one other thing I want to do before I leave the paper. Um, we replicated the paper using, going all the way back, if you remember the sample time period we used was the 1970 through 1990 sample time period. But I also downloaded the data 
for a different 20 year time period so that we could just now that we have the code completely done let's go see if we use a different sample time period I have the data I thought I had it downloaded oh maybe I deleted it well I guess I'm not gonna be able to do that in this video but I thought I had the data downloaded for 2003 through to through 2023 so the most recent 20 years the same initial data that we started with but I just I gathered the data for the for the most recent 20 year time period and see how how that looks but I don't have the data downloaded anymore I deleted it from the folder and I'm not gonna go back and grab it so I'm just gonna but what I did do so I replicated it with the most recent data if you just if we had the most recent data in our in our folders then we could just um, you know highlight everything hit F9 and it would do the study it would basically replicate ball brown for that 20 year time period because we we have all, we have all the code now it's complete our code is complete so i've actually already done that and i saved the figure i saved the figure one because that's the main thing that we care about is figure one do we get the same figure that looks like um this and the figure one using the most recent 20 years 2003 through 2023 I'm going to show you what that looks like. This is what the figure looks like for the most recent 20 years. So it doesn't look like Ball Brown. Leading up to the earnings announcement, you know, prices aren't rising for positive earnings announcements in the past. Prices. The market can't predict that's going to be positive in the future. Prices aren't already rising. Now, for the negative ones, prices are already falling, but they're not already rising for the positive ones. You see? So we have a kind of asymmetry here. Here it's symmetric. Well, it's not completely symmetric. Prices fall more in advance for the negative announcements than they, than they rise for the positive announcements. This is asymmetric, but it's even more asymmetric um, for the recent 20 years, as you can see. And look at the overall sample. And look at the graph. 1.1 all the way down to 0 0.75. Theirs didn't go below 0 0.88 or slightly below 0 0.88. 0 0.86 is their lowest the, when you plot the API. So this is what we're looking at currently. As far as post earnings announcement drift, there's not evidence of that here. For negative earnings surprises, prices are falling in advance, and then once earnings are announced, prices don't continue to fall. They level off immediately. They do fall later from month, months two on, and I'm not exactly sure why. For positive earnings surprises, first of all, prices aren't rising in advance leading up to it, and then once the earnings, announce, earnings are announced, prices don't rise even though it's a positive earnings announcement. Earnings were higher than expected, using the Ball Brown way of computing expected earnings, by the way. Not any other way. Prices actually fall. So that's weird. So either there's obviously several options. Either the replication, I've done something wrong. That's, I guess, the first option. Second option is I didn't do anything wrong. I replicated exactly what they would have done if they used this particular sample, and they would have gotten the exact same thing as this. And the, the, the problem, the reason we're not seeing the same pattern as we saw back there is because it's just a different sample. Um, the way that they compute expected uh, earnings, what we would expect for earnings, which they use this regression approach, they use the, they compute the unexpected change in earnings like we've talked about right here, equation one using the average market change as to form the expectation. Maybe that way of computing unexpected earnings doesn't work anymore. There's actually a better way to compute unexpected earnings. You just compare the actual earnings that are announced to what the analysts were forecasting. So use analyst forecasts, not a time series model to compute expected earnings, right? They do a time series model here to get the expected earnings. These are the expected earnings. Again, there should be a, a hat above this right here. I've said that before in a previous video. And this, these are the expected earnings. This right here is this. And then you take the actual minus the expected. 
to get the unexpected. And so this is a time series model of expected earnings based on average change in market earnings leading up to the given firm's change. But maybe that's a bad way of measuring expected earnings. Um, so we could replicate Ball Brown, but what we could do instead of measuring unexpected earnings this way, we could use analyst forecast to measure unexpected earnings that way and see do we still get the same figure. And I think studies have done that with analyst forecasts, not with the most recent 20 years of data, but you know, not too long ago there, was, there were some studies that replicated Ball Brown using analyst forecast to, to, um, as the estimate of um, earnings and then using not only the one factor model to estimate unexpected returns, but using a five factor model, the Fama French three factors, the Carhartt momentum factor, and then another factor. And they found results that were, that looked um, similar to this right here. So I guess with that, we're done with the replication and I hope you guys enjoyed this and learned something and I will see you on the next one.